Hey guys, thanks for joining me for another case. Today we're going to talk about Tina Lynn Stewart. On November 24th, 2017, 30-year-old Tina Stewart was violently and viciously beaten to death by her boyfriend of two years. The attack on Tina was so brutal that her boyfriend had compound fractures on at least one, if not both, of his hands. And you guys will never believe, actually you might on this channel, you might believe, the shocking sentence that he got for this horrific crime. So, Let's get into Tina's story. Tina Lynn Stewart was born in Fort Worth, Texas on July 28th, 1987. At some point, she moved to Washington. I'm unsure why or when she did that, but either way, her family loved her very much. Her parents said that she was a super daughter, and then when she became an adult, they nicknamed her Super Tina, <laughs> and she always had a way of turning her mom's day around. Tina was vivacious and loving. She attended Lewis and Clark High School in Spokane, Washington, and Spokane Community College after she graduated. She went on to get her early childhood education degree, and soon she got a job as a daycare teacher. Her ultimate dream was to work at Children's Garden Daycare. Although she was never married, Tina had two beautiful children, a son and a daughter, with a man that she had known since she was a bubbly 11-year-old. She even worked two jobs just to provide for them. Her life and her hobbies all revolved around kids. She was a Christian and she showed love to everybody. Sometimes when she would get off work after a long shift, she'd rush home to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches just so that she could go pass them out to the homeless before she had to pick up her kids from school. Tina was an incredibly kind person who touched many lives. Her family called her Tina the Tiny Tornado, a ball of energy who didn't take anything from anybody. Sometime in 2015, Tina started dating a guy, and it seemed like the relationship was okay for a while, but it didn't end that way. Just two years later, during the holiday season of 2017, things took a turn for the worse. Tina was going to be very busy that Thanksgiving. They had a lot of plans. The day before the holiday, her family came over and celebrated with her, and they would actually go on to say that this was one of the best holiday celebrations that their family has ever had. And the following day, Tina and her boyfriend went to Newman Lake, Washington to spend the day with his father. First of all, I don't know where the children were. I'm just going to throw that out there. Second of all, sometime throughout the day, the couple got extremely intoxicated. So intoxicated that Tina's boyfriend's dad actually insisted that they stay the night instead of driving in the state that they were in. And they agreed. And his dad went to bed around 11 p.m. I'm assuming it was sometime after he went to bed that Tina and her boyfriend started arguing. Tina's boyfriend would later go on to recall that the fight wasn't physical until they got upstairs, although they moved throughout the entire three stories of the house during this argument. Tina's boyfriend's dad does recall hearing noises that night and being woken up by them, but he wasn't sure what was going on. He couldn't tell if they were happy and laughing or if they were arguing. Tina's boyfriend said that during the argument, he shoved Tina and caused her to fall. I've read that he shoved her onto the bed and I've read that he shoved her onto the floor. I'm not sure which. Either way, when she was down, he was kicking her and punching her in the face. So bad that she started vomiting and bleeding out of her mouth. Tina's boyfriend would go on to say that during the assault, the two just calmed down on the basement floor and decided to pass out. He proceeded to wake up three times that night while Tina was lying next to him. The first time was at 4 a.m. He woke up, he looked over, Tina was unresponsive with vomit and blood pouring out of her mouth. He leaned, he leaned over, he wiped her face off, he cleaned up the area, and he went back to bed. The second time he woke up was at 6, and it was a very similar situation. He turned over, looked at Tina, she was unresponsive, and had blood and vomit coming out of her mouth. He once again leaned over, wiped her face, cleaned up the area, and went back to bed. The third time he woke up was at 8 a.m. He started panicking. He called his mom and she was like, you need to call 911. So he hung up, called 911, said that there was a woman on the premises with unknown medical issues. And as he's making this call, pacing around the driveway outside, his dad comes out and sees what's going on. By the time first responders got to 100 pound little Tina, her face and body was completely covered in scratches and bruises. She had apparent injuries. Her face and her cheeks were swollen. She had severe bruising to her chest and abdomen and abrasions on her torso that were consistent with being dragged across a rough surface like cement. 
They asked him what happened and if he had found her like this. And he proceeded to tell them, no, actually, we got into it last night and it was really bad. He told them about waking up a few times, seeing that she had blood and vomit and that he just kept going back to bed. They attempted life-saving measures on Tina, but everything was unsuccessful and she was pronounced dead. And it was very evident to the first responders that Tina's boyfriend not only had the compound fractures on one or both of his hands, but he also had significant injuries consistent with committing a violent assault on someone. He was arrested and sentenced to a whopping, ready for it? 16 years, 16 years. I don't even know what to think about that. A whole 195 months for second degree murder. Like, what is going on in Washington? What is going on in the legal system of Washington State? How is this possible? Last week, we learned about a case from Washington where a woman and her five-year-old daughter were viciously attacked, and, and that guy got, like, 30 years, and this guy beat her to death, and he got 16? I'm floored. How can we change this stuff, guys? What can we do? When her family heard the sentence, they were furious, and a lot of them actually stormed out of the courtroom and... They have since gone on to tell the media that they feel failed by the system, and I don't blame them. They miss her every single day, and life hasn't been easy for Tina's family after her death. One way that they want to honor her is by passing Tina's Law, which is something that we talked about in our video about Cassie Dewey, but it's a law that required domestic violence offenders to be put on a national registry for violent offenders. Her family has drafted and created the proposal worked tirelessly to spread awareness about it, and lobbied the bill to Congress. But the bill wasn't passed. I want to help them get this passed. Some of you guys have even mentioned a DV registry in the comments in some of my other videos. I think this is important. I know it's not going to save everybody, but it might save a life or two. And that's the whole point, isn't it? Is his niece. Her murder led him to work with lawmakers to create House Bill 1678, the statewide registry that would list people convicted of domestic violence. Representative Brad Clippert is one of the sponsors of the bill. I've spent four years of my life pushing for this, and I will, uh, I'm hoping this year we have success. I made a promise to Tina that I was going to do something about these domestic violence laws. In 2019 and 2020, the bill didn't move through. Estes cites current state code that allows anyone to access certain records and increase of DV cases as reason to pass this bill. We already have the laws on the books. Why not put them on a registry where people can look themselves? Estes is hopeful for 2022 being the year Tina's law is passed. Tina's remembered as a beautiful, kind, loving, fun, hardworking woman with a profound love for her children. And she will go on to impact many lives, especially if we can get this law passed. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to Tina's story. Um, just so you guys know, I do ask the victims for permission and for guidance when I make these videos. And I also don't use the perpetrator's name because I feel like the story is about the victim and not the perpetrator. All right, you guys stay safe out there. Thanks for joining me for Tina's case.